Uh, so now let's move on to current. We're going really quick now. So now we're already in current. And the idea is to absorb as much light as possible in as thin a layer as possible. And so uh, you obviously want to have as much absorption as possible. So the more strongly absorbing semiconductors are, have a direct band gap. If they're weakly absorbing, they have an indirect band gap. As it so happens, the dominant solar cell material, which is silicon, has an indirect band gap. So many of the problems in solar cells today are due to the weak absorption of silicon. Uh, but nonetheless, silicon is attracting all the subsidies. So uh, the, uh, this is the uh, problem with subsidies. You, you get more of the older technology. Uh, so that's one of the factors is you want a strong absorber. But there's another factor that uh, comes into play. Uh, suppose you have a uh, thin film. And it's a film. And you come in and you absorb. It, you refract in. And you can refract right back out again. And you're, you have one chance to absorb the light. And uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of unfortunate. Because if you had just done a little minor change, that is to texture one of the surfaces, just introduce a little bit of texture, what would happen is the light ray would come in, it would get scattered at some odd angle, and uh, scattered again. And before you know it, the light ray doesn't even remember what the original angle was. And it's randomly going around inside the semiconductor. So you say, well, that seems like it would be beneficial. But it's actually super beneficial. And the reason is that the chance of escaping is very, very small once the light ray is sort of randomized internally. And in, in fact, this angle is about 16 degrees. This cone angle is 16 degrees. And it's a, a, only about a 2% chance of escaping. And with only a 2% chance, chance of escaping, this light ray will bounce around many times, perhaps um, uh, over a path length 50 times greater than the original thickness. And so this improvement is quite large. It, it looks like it's of order of magnitude 1. You have to remember, the refractive index of semiconductors is typically around 3.5. You square it, you get 12. You multiply by 4, now you're up to 50. So uh, it is a huge effect which uh, somehow was not taken into account in the early days. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this effect is a little bit hard to understand. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to explain it. It, it is a, a, a very uh, surprising uh, result. And I will compare two similar types of devices, the solar cell and the light emitting diode. And I just showed you the solar cell. Let me show you the same problem in a light emitting diode. In a light emitting diode, uh, the light is emitted internally, and it has to escape. But only 2% finds it easy to escape. 98% of the light tends to be trapped and bounce around. Uh, this is very dangerous in an LED, because you could lose that photon. There are plenty of places you could lose a photon. Uh, and it'll bounce, bounce, bounce many times forever until you lose it. So it's pretty bad. Uh, so in the old days, let's say 20 years ago, for LEDs, People say, oh, well, what's your LED efficiency? They, th they thought 2% was a pretty good efficiency, because they were accustomed to that. Uh, however, if you play the same trick and texture one of the surfaces, the light ray, the internal light ray, randomizes in direction, gets kind of lost, but eventually bounces around. It may take a quite a few bounces, but eventually it gets out. And so these types of uh, LEDs are uh, much more efficient. And in fact, virtually all uh, LEDs are made this way now. And in fact, all solar cells are made this way now. It just took a little bit for people to uh, catch on. Now, uh, your probability of getting light out, it's well over 50%. In the best LEDs, you can get over 50% efficiency. And most of the efficiency loss is just due to the light trying to find the, this escape cone. So this is all very interesting, very puzzling. In a way, it's kind of obvious. Because someone would say, oh, yes, the LED is the reciprocal device to the solar cell. Solar cell takes in light, produces electricity. The LED takes in electricity, puts out light. Obviously, you optimize them both to the same device. You, you optimize them the same way. Some people say this is obvious, that this should be this way. But uh, let me try to give a more fundamental explanation to this. And it goes back to the time when you were in kindergarten. So in kindergarten, uh, you get taught about shapes. And luckily, they don't try to teach the kindergarten children what is the meaning of the word ergodic. Okay? Ergodic is one of these uh, very bad words. 
And I remember uh, taking, a, when I was in graduate school, I took a class on statistical mechanics from a theoretical physicist. And this is ergodic, that's not ergodic, and so on and so forth. And wow, that was confusing. And, uh, and when I graduated, or I just, I didn't graduate, I just finished that class. I said, thank God, I'm probably never going to have to use that word again. Okay? And so here it comes up again, but I think it's a little bit more meaningful in this context. Uh, here are some shapes, some basic kindergarten shapes, and let's see how the light rays behave. So let's say we have a rectangle. That's similar to what we talked about. Light goes in or goes right back out again. Does not get trapped. Okay, what about the sphere? Uh, well, actually, let's do the parallel parallelogram first. The parallelogram is the same as the rectangle, pretty much. And the sphere, you just do ray tracing. You go in, you refract, and it's exactly the same angle on the other side, and you get right back out again. Okay. Now, this is to be contrasted with another group of shapes that are a little bit more odd. And uh, so, for example, you have a trapezoid. A trapezoid has some funny angles, and the light ray goes in, and before you know it, it's going off at some funny angle and has a devil of a time trying to find the escape cone. So this is qualitatively different from this. Uh, ergodic is qualitatively different from non-ergodic. And uh, the, um, the difference is, in the way it would be expressed by physicists, they would say uh, that the, um, they say the phase space average is equal to the time average. Uh, that's a little opaque. So let me say that over time, uh, these light rays explored all the possible internal angles. And over time, these were unable to explore all the internal angles because they went right back out again. Okay? And that is the meaning of the word ergodic, is whether over time you go every possible place you can go. And, um, so there's a qualitative difference between these shapes. And indeed, if you're making optoelectronic devices, you want them to be ergodic. You don't want them to be uh, this more simplified uh, geometry. And in an LED, all this light would escape. And if it were a solar cell, you'd get, get the maximum chance to absorb the light. And here, most of the internal light can never escape. It's quite a big difference. So uh, that kind of explains why we should uh, 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 try to break the plane parallel symmetry. And it does have a rather huge effect. Now, the effect is 4n squared. People ask me um, where that comes from. So if you do the density of optical modes, and this is just density of states for people who've taken physics classes. It has refractive index squared in it. Fine. That gives you a big boost. So you have many more states. And if you can fill those states, you'll have a lot more light presence. So that's good. More, more light means more absorption. Now, you're doing a double pass. You pick up a factor 2. And there's an, an additional factor 2 from cosine theta averaging. So net net, it's 2 times 2 times n squared is 4n squared. It's a really big number. However, I, since you heard Swanson last week, let me tell you a little story. So I had written a manuscript on this. This was 30 years ago. And I brought uh, Swanson in as a consultant. And I showed him the manuscript. And he, he read it. And he said, you've got a mistake in the manuscript. You forgot the cosine theta averaging. And luckily, it hadn't appeared yet in print. And we were able to go back and uh, fix that extra factor, too. Otherwise, I would be explaining forever why it's 4n squared, not 2n squared which I still have to explain from time to time. So that's a little human interest there. OK, so um, you have to texture. And you'll, you'll see in a minute there's other benefits if you, uh, for photon recycling. This is, this is getting ahead of ourselves. Don't even look at this part. OK, so what is the benefit? You can make your solar cell 50 times thinner and still absorb the same amount of light. So this is rather a very substantial benefit, this, particularly in silicon, which is a weak absorber. Uh, so uh, 50 times, you know, the, the semiconductor material, people used to say it's, that's the most expensive part. And that can be made 50 times cheaper. Uh, so I, I think everyone will go for that. Um, and if, you, if the cell is thinner, the, often there's less serious resistance. and you improve the fill factor. But here's a very important point. Remember I said there's more free energy if it's concentrated. That light inside that uh, material is concentrated by 4n squared. And so you get the voltage boost associated with that. And uh, that's a little bit less obvious than you're just absorbing light better. 
you're actually boosting the voltage. It's, a, it's quite substantial. It's a tenth of a volt at the operating point. Uh, a lot of silicon cells operate at around half a volt, so this could potentially boost uh, the silicon solar cell from half a volt to six tenths of a volt. It's, very, it's a very good benefit. Now, the people get upset though. Say, you want to do total internal reflection of the light to trap it, and at the same time, you want to put on an anti-reflection coating. Okay, so the, seemingly, those words are at odds with one another. And, uh, but they're actually completely compatible. Because yes, most of the light rays are trapped by total internal reflection. A small percentage are able to escape. The ones that escape get the benefit of the anti-reflection coating. The anti-reflection coating does not harm the total internal reflection. So they can coexist fine, and in, indeed this is the way solar cells are made today. You have, you have an anti-reflection coating, but it doesn't uh, prevent the trapping of the light internally. Okay, now I was at a, uh, so I've been put, I, in the old days, 30, I pushed this idea. I wasn't having very many buyers at that time, and I got a little frustrated, and I said, I, I'm young, I can do other things. So I went and I did other things, uh, and uh, I was very surprised. I went into a convention here in San Francisco, is all the manufacturers, this, this I got off a poster from one of the manufacturers. Uh, they were basically uh, selling a process for texturing uh, the solar cells. Indeed, uh, all the um, silicon solar cells, virtually all of them are, are now textured uh, this way. So uh, they finally caught on to this uh, opportunity. Now, on the other hand, people are often asking me, gee, if texturing is good, maybe a special texture would be better. And uh, I, um, I took a little umbrage at that because, in fact, I was able to show that uh, random roughness already approaches the theoretical limit, which is given by statistical mechanics. So how can you do, if, if you, what's the point of putting on your fancy texture if a random texture already reaches the theoretical limits? Uh, so I was not too encouraged by efforts literally from the very beginning. People have always said, we're going to beat the 4n squared factor. Um, but then people asked me differently. They said, okay, you've done a lot of photonic crystals. Can a photonic crystal do better than a randomly rough surface? My, my instinct was to say, no, no, no. But then I thought for a minute, the proof I had applied to geometrical optics. In, um, if you had a very thin film solar cell, and they're becoming thinner and thinner, then you're dealing with wave optics. And I did not have any proof for wave optics. So we don't know the correct answer for wave optics. So it's possible, maybe in the wave optics regime, a photonic crystal could possibly do better. So we actually did a little bit of uh, research on this uh, to try to figure out uh, what was possible. Now, uh, gallium arsenide, uh, I think the example I have here is uh, the 3, 5, 7, uh, gallium arsenide. It's very strongly absorbing. You don't even need three microns. But let's say you had three microns to absorb the sunlight. It would be totally absorbed. And let's say you had the benefit of the 4 n squared factor. Man, you'd get down to 60 nanometers, which nobody's even thinking of making a solar cell as thin as 60 nanometers. So here's the question. If the solar cell really was 60 nanometers, you're firmly in the, it's like way smaller than a wavelength. So you can't use geometrical optics. So let's see if it's possible to beat random roughness. And uh, so I have here uh, a, uh, uh, an example, and I'm inclined now. I don't know. How are we doing with time, Krishna? Yeah, so when people leave, I stop talking. Is that the idea? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we have so much to get through, but I, I can't resist showing you a movie. But let, let's see if, if this will work here. So I've got the movie in here. And let's see. Uh, so I have a student doing an optimization. Um, and what this optimization is consisting of, uh, there's supposed to be a movie here. Let's see if there is. Yeah, there's a movie. OK. So let me explain what's going on. Uh, she has uh, created a periodic texture in the thin film. It's like uh, maybe uh, less than 100 nanometers thick. It's very, very thin. And she's created a periodic texture. And then uh, what she's going to do is uh, follow an optimization program and uh, let the texture evolve to give you the maximum amount of absorption or absorption enhancement. Now, the absorption enhancement depends very much upon frequency. and uh, I am a big one. I, I insist that all my students should uh, use frequency instead of wavelength. I'm sorry. 
Uh, but this is, corresponds to the band edge of gallium arsenide, where it's weakly absorbing. So the idea is to uh, boost the absorption uh, down where gallium arsenide is a relatively uh, weak absorber. And so let's see what the movie shows. It's going to iterate, and it's going to initially uh, try to boost the weakest absorption. So let's get this thing going. And it's evolving, evolving, evolving. And there it evolved to something weird. Now, it boosted the absorption, and it's pretty good at all frequencies. So it, 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 it helped them all get up. But you end up with a very unusual situation, uh, symmetry breaking. And in fact, uh, she's done a lot of these optimizations. It's very clear that although you might start symmetrical, uh, when you optimize, uh, you get spontaneous symmetry breaking. And uh, this seems to be uh, very much a property. Uh, let's see if I can um, show you another movie. And uh, this one, let's see. No, I'm, I've used up all my movies for now. OK. Uh, the. Uh, Let's go back to where we were. So we were here. And uh, oh, here's the movie. Which I'm in the right file. Let's just see. Uh, yeah, I'm in the right file, I think. So um, you end up with the symmetry, symmetry breaking like this. And uh, then uh, if you ask, well, where do you find the optimal absorption? Uh, if you think in terms of, of a photonic crystal, you find it up here. Uh, oops, let me write with it. So up here in the very high bands of the photonic crystal, uh, this, this region of the band structure has a, a name. It's called the spaghetti region, because you see the bands are all complicated like spaghetti. And that seems to be the optimum point. And if you're down here where you normally are with band structure, down at this point or at this point, no, you don't, you don't get a very good absorption. So that, that part is uh, kind of interesting. So let's see if I can pull up another movie here. And yeah, sometimes it takes a while to, to, uh, uh, for this thing to appear. Well, OK, uh, maybe it's just a still. Uh, in any case, uh, the lesson is to uh, try to have this uh, very complicated texture. You do get the symmetry breaking, and you do get some very odd shapes in there. Okay. So let me make sure I'm in the right file. Okay, I'm in the right file now. Uh, so that is the uh, lesson of um, of uh, the current: is that you want to texture. Uh, you even for very thin films, you want to texture them. Okay. So, uh, and then you get the maximum current and so forth. Now, so I've done fill factor, I've done current, let me go to voltage. Now, voltage is what nobody wants to talk about. The reason is that voltage is hard. You have to understand statistical mechanics. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's easier to do the current. To do the current, it's like being a bookkeeper. You have the, the current, it's like money coming in. And so you get this much, you get that much, and, or everybody contributes. So you just have to keep track of the flows of money. That's not so hard. You can be an accountant, a CPA. Um, uh, physics is a little bit harder. Voltage is harder. So people don't talk about voltage too much. But this is a shame, because there, there is actually tremendous opportunity to increase the voltage of a solar cell. Now, I uh, say, well, how are we even going to approach voltage? So you, I, ma I made a big point that you have to uh, talk about the operating point voltage, which is lower than the open circuit voltage, but it's controlled by thermodynamics. It's actually just a little bit lower, and if we can get the highest open circuit voltage, we'll also get the highest operating point voltage. So let's just work on getting the highest open circuit voltage. So I said voltage is hard, so I'm going to try to make the voltage easy. Actually, this is legitimate. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, oversimplifying at all. Uh, let me assume that in your freshman chemistry, you learned about the Boltzmann factor. So everybody should remember that the higher energy level has a lower probability. And that lower probability is given by the Boltzmann factor. And the Boltzmann factor is a ratio of probabilities. So let me accept that, and I will ask for the following ratio of probabilities. In the sunlight, the excited state is populated. Uh, obviously, the, the sunlight is boosting it up. Whereas in the dark, you might say, oh, there's nothing in the dark. But there's always a little bit. 
because in the dark you're still at room temperature. There's going to be some tiny, tiny number of uh, excited molecules, excited electrons. So let's say uh, you happen to accept the, the Boltzmann factor. Then I've got you, because uh, you can then take uh, the natural log of the Boltzmann factor, and I'll end up with uh, energy on the left side of the equation. On the right side, I have the natural log. I pick up a KT from here, so prefactor. And now it tells me that I'm going to I'm going to say the voltage was the free energy. So it's simply uh, the ratio of uh, two probabilities. So, uh, so that's pretty straightforward. And now you have the voltage. All you need to know is the excited state population in the light. Uh, here's where Shockley came in. He actually, uh, sim uh, you already know enough for voltage. I'm just going to show you how Shockley did it, which is kind of interesting. He says that the probability of being in the excited state, well, if you're in the excited state, you're, you have a certain probability of, em of emitting, and, uh, but you'll, uh, you also have a probability of being in the excited state in pitch darkness just from uh, the thermal excitation. So Shockley says, well, this, this, it's the same equation. It says, J as a monitor of being in the excited state, let me compare uh, the emission from the excited state in the light divided by the emission from the excited state in the dark. Okay, so that's the same thing as what I showed on the previous slide. But then he, he said one more thing, which was uh, uh, kind of uh, brilliant. He said, well, wait a minute. If I have a perfect solar cell, what emission can I expect? Let's say I have a perfect solar cell. It's an open circuit. It's an open circuit, no current flows, so the electrons and holes have no place to go. Where are they going to go in a perfect solar cell? So there's only uh, there's only one place that uh, they can go, and that is they can go back at the sun. And he's, and he says that in an ideal solar cell, all of the incoming photons would be, come back at the sun as emitted photons. This is my executive assistant, doesn't know how to, how to take no for an answer here. Okay, uh, so, um, so he made this leap from the emission. He says the emission is the same as the incoming sunlight. So this is a really easy equation. Uh, we have the incoming sunlight, which we know, and the emission in the dark, which is not very much, but it's just controlled by uh, the small thermal uh, excitation probability. And he says, and take natural log, and that's a very big number, obviously. And uh, you take the natural log, and uh, you multiply by KT, and that's the open circuit voltage. And, th and there's a lesson in that that uh, needed to be relearned. Uh, this paper is a long time ago, and it's a very interesting story. I, I, knew, I once worked with someone who was a contemporary of Shockley, told me a little bit about the background. In the question period, you can ask me about what was Shockley thinking during that time. Okay, so yeah, but this Shockley stuff and all that. Here's an easier way to get the voltage, and that is to recognize that photons have free energy, and also photons have entropy. So let's say uh, you may have taken a course, and you learned that the uh, free energy of something, maybe in chemistry, is U minus TS. And so, well, what's the U? Uh, the U is the photon energy, obviously, but photons have entropy. And so uh, entropy in statistical mechanics is how many possible arrangements you could have. So it's a natural log of the total number of arrangements. And so you have your photon energy minus a little bit, and that converts it to free energy. So this bit is what you lose from the photon energy. And in fact, that's a pretty good way of looking at the voltage. And you're now say, well, how, you know, maybe you're an undergraduate and uh, so I don't know how to calculate entropy of sunlight. So sun, this is a statement, sunlight has entropy, the photons in the sunlight have entropy. So I, I don't know how to calculate it. So I'm gonna give you an easy way to calculate it. It's all the different possible combinations. So let's say you're standing out in the parking lot and uh, the sun's rays are coming down at you. So you pretty much know the direction that the sun's rays are coming from. In fact, you know within about half a degree because that's how big the sun is in the sky, okay? But the solar cell actually doesn't know because the solar cell is obligated to collect all the light from all possible angles because the solar cell doesn't want to miss any light. 
So it collects all the light from all possible angles, throws away the information about the exact angle that the sun was in the sky. So by throwing away that information, thrown away information is entropy. And uh, you ask, well, how many combinations could there be? Well, the sun's about half a degree. And you say, well, how many suns can I fit in the entire sky? It's half a degree. And you work it out from the solid angle. It works out there's about 40,000 suns will fit in the sky. So the light could have come from any one of 40,000 angles, but it came from one particular angle. And so the number of combinations is 40,000. That's to say the sun subtends an angle 1 40,000th of the hemisphere. And uh, so that's entropy. That's uh, you've thrown away the information which one out of the 40,000 was. And that is actually the dominant contribution to the entropy of sunlight. And immediately you lose about 3 tenths of a volt. That's like your worst entropy. The biggest entropy is the easiest one to calculate. Uh, now, people get puzzled by this. They say the angle subtended by the sun in the sky, what does that have to do with solid state physics? Does it say solar cell? is solid state electrical engineering. What does that have to do with astrophysics? Astrophysics is the angle subtended by the sun, but it does. And uh, that's your biggest entropy contribution. Uh, now, there's others. It, you know, when you go into a material, you refract toward the normal. And so you lose the 4 n squared factor. And if you throw that angle information away, uh, there you get the tenth of a volt I talked about. You lose another tenth of a volt trying to coax the electrons into the wire. Why should they go into the wire? They can stay in the solar cell. So you give up a tenth of a volt to coax them into the wire. And then here, here's another bad one. Uh, people persist in making very bad solar cells with very bad performance, which is uh, 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 monitored by the luminescence efficiency. Shockley said go for 100% luminescence efficiency. They have materials that are seriously used with like 10 to minus 5 luminescence efficiency. Of course, you lose a lot of voltage, according to the natural log, etc. And there's some other small terms. So this way of doing it, uh, which I, I like the best, because you start with the photon energy or the band gap, and then you subtract off a bunch of terms, uh, each of which is sort of manageable. Uh, this was actually put forward by a graduate student 40 years ago. The graduate student at Berkeley who was not working on solar cells, he was working on photosynthesis. And he, he laid it out this way. It was a very neat way of explaining the uh, voltage. So we're almost done with the voltage, but I have a caution, uh, is that after you subtract all these terms, three tenths, one tenth, one tenth, three, after you subtract all those terms, there's not that much left. And you've got to be cautious. The voltage is very important. If you subtract all those terms, you end up with only three tenths of volt from huge photons, maybe two volt photons. So you, you have to be very careful with the voltage and with the ability to emit light.